Have you seen the video Joe Reed actually being truthful about the genocide? At least one person at MSNBC is actually honest. Yeah, I think it's like one of those circumstances where um, as long as there's no Bernie Sanders at play, Joanne Reed is like, no, you know what I want to talk about, actually? I want to talk about a liberal writer, very important thinker, especially like uh, under the Obama administration, a lot of people uh, hated him slash also uh, revered him. Uh, I'm talking about ta Coates. Coates. I'm going to be talking about ta Coates Coates because he said something that I find very interesting. Like he, he had a moment of like self-reflection and honesty that I think a lot of thinkers in the United States of America should honestly engage with. Um, he, he basically, I mean, he did the biggest mistake of his life. He, he went to actually Palestine. He, he went to Palestine. You can't do that. You can't, you can't go to the West Bank, especially as a black man, and, and come out of that experience uh, not recognizing exactly what the fuck is going on. Now, for ta uh, as, as you guys know, he's, he's talked about reparations quite a bit, and I agree with him. Reparations are a, a moral necessity. Um, I've always liked Tani's easy bat. He's not bad, but he is a liberal. Okay? He is, he is a liberal. Thing is, Tanahisi Coates had uh, talked about a successful form of reparations um, uh, and, and made a case for how uh, black reparations, like African descendants of slaves, could get reparations in the United States of America by, by pointing to the successful example of reparations in Israel, right? German government gave reparations to Israel for Holocaust. This was a part of his work. Now, he straight up came out and openly said, I will for the rest of my life work to undo the damage that I have caused to the Palestinians. Not necessarily to say like that the reparations argument is wrong, or not necessarily to say that um, Israel did not deserve reparations. Of course they did, right? Like, Jews deserve reparations, not Israel specifically. Jewish people deserve reparations after uh, the Holocaust, of course. But his frustration with his own writing came from not going and seeing Israel... And, uh, and, and the West Bank with his own two eyes. Uh, we are going to be talking about campus demonstrators today as well. There's a lot of misinformation going around on campus demonstrations and whatnot. But yeah, here's what ta Coates at PalFest said. Okay, this is a Palestinian uh, literary festival. Here's what he said on, uh, at PalFest. He said, I'm a latecomer to this. I will probably be making amends for this until the day they put me in the ground. If I'm honest, when, in one of my most celebrated works of journalism, I had to demonstrate tangibly how a reparations program could be done, I looked to Israel. One of my golden rules about reporting is you only write after reporting. And I wrote without going. For me, personally, there's a thing of making amends, and it is terribly, ferociously important to me. Then he also went on, of course, my favorite broadcast on the fucking planet, the most consistent uh, outlet of, of real news and, and dedicated reporting, uh, and, uh, Democracy Now!, you know, the greatest, the greatest institution, okay? The amount of respect I have for everyone that works there, I mean, they are, oh, I love them. I love them so much, and I hope you do too. Um, always incredible work from them. So yeah, he went on, he went on to clarify what he means by that. Okay. He went on to clarify. I had this degree of anxiety about going, um, because I knew I was going to see something, um, something I couldn't quite name. And I knew because of my upbringing, because of my mother, because of my father, because of my wife, because of my son. I thought you were being sarcastic. Fuck no. No, dude. He literally went to the West Bank and was like, oh my God, this is some racist ass bullshit. Because let's be real, okay? Any black person, any black person, any brown person, most brown people living in the United States of America, they go to 
they they go to the West Bank. They'd be like, oh shit, I know exactly what the fuck's going on here. Like, what the fuck? This is like the the final stage of like what we fear will happen to us in America, right? And what has happened to us in America in uh, previous formations, like it's impossible not to realize. It is especially impossible not to realize when you're fucking Ta-Nehisi Coates, like you know, a very important, uh, uh, a very important journalist that has spoken and uh, about black history in America, you know, like this is not some random fucking dude, but any random fucking dude would most likely see it. Let me, let me take it one step further. Random white people will also understand exactly what the fuck's going on, especially if they go to Gaza. Daniel Day Lewis is a great example of this. 2005 Daniel Day Lewis, the goat, he went, Daniel Day Lewis went to Gaza. Okay. I mean, you should read what he had to say about what was going on. And he wrote about it. He wrote about his experiences. That's why I always say, like, listen, if you're not, if you are not born outside of the United States or if you didn't grow outside of the United States, if you're not outside of, like, the, the immediate sphere of influence of the United States and, uh, and you want to develop a better understanding, just, like, if you visit one of these fucking places, if you see the rubble, if you see the consequences of American imperialism and all of its endless might okay all the bloodshed that it has caused you will become a different person you will develop a much better understanding of what the fuck really is up anthony bourdain is another example of this there is not a single person this is a phenomena most experienced most commonly experienced by active duty service members veterans okay that's why there's a massive, uh, uh, there's, there's, why there's a lot of groups out there of, of veterans who are, are anti-war now. Like, if you're a fucking, if you're some dumbass uh, boy from Arkansas, fucking 17, 18 years old, and the first time you leave the country is when you're, you know, getting dropped into Iraq or Afghanistan, and then you see the atrocities that you're committing... Uh, and and uh, what you are doing is a part of like your quote unquote job. You very you you for the first time ever develop a, a very different understanding. Now that doesn't mean that all veterans are like this. Some of them don't want to meet uh, the the uh, moral conundrum and and you know choose to hand wave it away. Okay, are you comparing Israeli occupation to American imperialism? What? So argument for reparations using Israel as an example backfires. Imagine that. No, this is the argument for reparations is sound and the argument for reparations is just. He's just saying that he should have been a little bit more considerate about his coverage on Israel rather than just simply talking about it like it's a shining beacon of democracy. Um, that's what he's saying. Anyway. Um, and also on top of that, what did you say? What was the second thing that you asked me, which was contentious? I can answer you as well. Are you comparing Israeli occupation to American imperialism? No, I'm not doing that as a matter of fact. What I'm doing instead is, first of all, Israeli occupation is American imperialism. If you don't understand that reality, I don't know what you think. I don't know why you think it's happening and why you think people just uh, not only uh, refuse to assess the brutality with honest terms, but instead immediately champion it. Um, <laughs> Because like any other, any alternative to this is basically just anti-Semitic theories. I think M most alternatives to uh, to to assuming that there's like some secondary reason that's not American imperialism uh, would be often uh, just a anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that like some Jews have some profound influence on. Uh, American Congress and American media or some shit. No, nah, we're good. My first comment was in jest. The second was more illuminating on the comparison. So, um, I don't understand why he has to make amends then. Well, let's hear what he has to say about it. That after I saw the thing, I would have to come back and talk about it. Um, that there was no option in which I did not talk about it. And I, and I thought I was going to another country but in fact, what amazed me was I actually felt that I was in the same country. But I was in a different time. I was in the time of my parents and my grandparents. I can think back to um, all of the articles I've read, all the 
things I've seen said about how complicated and how complex the situation is and the occupation is. I say it's complex, it's complicated. And it's made to sound as though you need a degree um, in Middle Eastern studies or some such, a PhD, to really understand what's happening. But I understood the first day. Yeah. We went uh, to East Jerusalem uh, <clears throat> to try to visit in the way that uh, uh, Muslims uh, visit to Alaska Mosque. And, and I can remember being there, and there were four IDF guards, biggest guns I'd ever seen in my life. And they checked IDs, and they gave us our IDs back. And then they did nothing. They just made us wait. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. There was no list, there was no protocol, there was no anything. They were just making us wait because they could. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was like, I know what this is. I know exactly what this is. The second day we went to Hebron, and I can remember walking down streets with a Palestinian guide. And we would get to certain streets, and he would say, I can't walk down this street with you. You can walk, I cannot, because I'm Palestinian. And I thought, I, I know what that is. As we drove through the occupied territories, and I would look out, and I would see roads that Palestinians could use, and roads that only Israeli Jews could use, I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw different colored license plates for different classes of people, I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw communities that I can only describe as, as segregated, I said, this is Chicago, it's Baltimore, it's Philadelphia. And I don't mean to center the whole world on America. We have a tendency to do that. But my lens is my lens. This is all I have. And what I felt was a tremendous weight. I felt the obvious thing that I think all of us feel, that our tax dollars are effectively subsidizing apartheid, or subsidizing a segregationist order, a Jim Crow regime. But I also felt that as an African American who was reared on the fight against Jim Crow, against white supremacy, against apartheid, I, I, I felt tremendous shame. How could I not know? Yep. How could I not know that the only democracy in the Middle East as it builds itself is segregated? How did I not know that? And, and what, I, what I came to, Michelle, was that Israel is a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, in the exact same way that America is the oldest democracy in the world. <laughs> so the relationship was quite clear. It was, it was quite clear, it was palpable, it was felt, and, um, and the responsibility was clear after that. Yeah, well, I, I'll say a couple of things. I, I think it's really important to acknowledge something. Um, and that is that, I, you know, I'm a relative latecomer to this. Um, it, it's not something that I had a real knowledge of. I had an intuition for it. I had an awareness of the tradition. But it really was not until I went there that I had um, a tactile feeling for it. One of the things that I will probably be making amends for until the day they put me in the ground, if I'm honest, um, is in one of my most celebrated works of journalism, when I had to demonstrate tangibly how a repar uh, uh, reparations program could be done, I looked to Israel. This is reason, yeah. And you know, like I think about that. And one of my golden rules about writing is that, you know, you only write after you've reported, you only write after, and I wrote without going. I wrote without going. Um, and so, while there is this long tradition of solidarity, um, for me personally, there's a thing of making amends. Um, and it is terribly, ferociously important to me. Um, 
I think about that and I think about how gracious people were when I was over there. I think about how they took me into their homes. I think about how they fed me. And I think about how their only request was, when you go back, don't lose your voice. That was all they asked. They was all they asked. And so for me, um, I am obviously aware of the tradition. But this is like personal. You know what I mean? Like I, I have some debts to pay. You know? And I, and I, I think like it's really, really important to be, that I be clear about that. Yes, well. He wrote this uh, uh, much, uh, he, he went after he wrote, uh, he went to the West Bank after he wrote uh, about reparations um, and, and how successful it would work uh, off of Israel. And like, obviously this doesn't mean that like, reparations doesn't work or that uh jewish people did not deserve reparations uh in the aftermath of the holocaust of course they did um and and reparations will work of course and whether it could successfully be implemented or not does not change the morality behind it right um but he's just simply stating that like there is um, there was a lot more that he could have said about the situation. Like there was a lot more that he could have analyzed rather than, um, rather than simply state like, you know, th that Israel is a shining beacon of democracy. <laughs> um, where are we now in terms of censorship? What do you fear? And how do you think people ought to respond in this moment in time? You know, oddly enough, I think we're in a... All right, anyway, so here, I'll, uh, he, give, he goes into more detail here about his experience in the West Bank, which uh, caused them to immediately on the first day realize that at the top of the hour there's a three-minute ad break and uh, that some people will not see the ad. Those people are subscribed, and some people will see the ad. Those people are the unsubscribed, right? <laughs> now, if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free. Here is the uh, three minute ad break now. Dynamic jab 13. Thank you for the 10 give the subs. Dual max 95. Thank you for the five. Flocky, thank you for the 10 give the subs. This is a three minute ad break now. I, I spent 10 days um, in Palestine in the occupied territories and in, in Israel proper. Um, I've had the great luxury over the past 10 years of seeing uh, a few countries. Uh, I have not spent more time or seen more of. Uh, another country or another territory than, than I did uh, this summer. Um, I think what shocked me the most... Mesu y, Mesu's YB, thank you for the five gifted. Maxilla 4L, thank you for the five. The Raging Hopper, thank you for the five gifted. Most was uh, in any sort of um, opinion piece or reported piece or, or whatever you want to call it that I've read, about Israel and about the conflict with the Palestinians is a word that comes up uh, all the time, and it is complexity. That hmm. and its uh, closely related uh, adjective, complicated. And so while I had my skepticisms and I had my suspicions of the Israeli government of the occupation, um, what I expected was that I would find a situation in which it was hard to discern right from wrong. It was hard to understand the morality at play. Um, it was hard to understand the conflict. And perhaps the most shocking thing was uh, I immediately understood uh, what was going on over there. Probably the best example I, I, I can think of is, is, is the second day uh, when we went to Hebron and, and, and the reality of the occupation uh, became clear. We were driving uh, out of East Jerusalem. I was with uh, the Palestinian, uh, the, was with Powell Fest, um, and we were driving out of East Jerusalem uh, into the West Bank, and you know you could see the settlements, and they would point out the settlements, and it suddenly dawned on me that I was in a region of the world <coughs> where some people could vote and some people could not, and that was obviously very, very familiar to me. I got to Hebron, and we got out as a group of writers, and we were given a tour by a Palestinian guide, and we got to uh, a certain street, and he said to us, I can't walk down the street. If you want to continue, you have to continue without me. 
and, and, and that was shocking to me. And we, we, we walked down the street, and we came back, and there was a, a market area. Uh, Hebron is very, very poor. It wasn't always very poor, but it's, it's very, very poor. Its market area has been shut down. But there are a few vendors there that, that, that I wanted to support. And I was walking to try to get to the vendor, and I was stopped at a checkpoint. Checkpoints all through the city. The checkpoints, obviously, all through the West Bank. Uh, your mobility is, is, is completely uh, inhibited, and the mobility of, of, of the Palestinians is totally inhibited. And I was walking to the checkpoint, and an Israeli uh, guard uh, stepped out, probably about the age of my son. And he said to me, what's your religion, bro? And I said, well, I don't, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not really religious. And he said, come on, stop messing around. What is your religion? I said, I'm, I'm not playing. I'm not, I'm not really religious. And it became clear to me. Like the fucking audacity, dude. This is, this is what it is. It's just like. When you're so trained and so conditioned into behaving this way against a, a population that you have made, uh, I don't know what terms to use here, a, a population that you've ritualistically humiliated and subjugated, you think you can do the same shit to, to even international, like international members of the press, authors. And the reason why you think you can do this is because you're like, well, they're Palestinian supporters. You know what I mean? They're, they're Palestinian supporters. Otherwise, why the fuck would they be in the West Bank, right? So he thinks he could just, like, get away with, especially because uh, Ta-Nehisi is black, too, because, like, the the white supremacist undertone of of the the broader fascist ideology uh, that, that is very much alive inside of Israel is, is definitely there. There is historic precedent for it, obviously. Uh, look to what uh, the, the Israeli government's uh, operations were uh, in dealing with Ethiopian Jews when they first came in. Look to the way that the Israeli government first dealt with Arab Jews, as a matter of fact. Like, there's always been a dedicated effort to, like, uh, uh, try to Europeanize um, Europeanize Israel, but also like, you know, try to make the population as white as possible, increase white population numbers and decrease black Jewish uh, population numbers in general. And that, of course, is uh, an extension of, of having a, a broader fascist ideology. Then unless I professed my religion and the right religion, I wasn't going to be allowed to walk forward. So he said, well, okay, so what was your parents' religion? I said, well, they weren't that religious either. He says, what were your, what are, what were your grandparents' religion? And I said, my grandmother was a Christian. And then he allowed me to pass. And it became very, very clear to me what was going on there. And I have to say, it, it, it was quite <laughs> familiar. Again, I and he's like, it's like just ironic because like, this is why the uh, this is why I always say like Israel is basically an American state, right? Because one, the very same IDF is in some ways being funded by our tax dollars, his tax dollars, right? Now, listen, this is also important. One very important criticism from black activists uh, within the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality is always, you take our tax dollars and you fund the police with our tax dollars and then the police come back and occupy us like an occupying force, okay? So he's experiencing that as a black man in America and now he's experiencing that as a black man in the West Bank, in occupied territory, right? Occupied Palestinian land. But it goes a little bit further than that. The IDF also trains the American police departments especially in the aftermath of 9-11, where this collaborative effort became uh, a matter of policy, where uh, the, the American police departments went to Israel to get training, to get counterterrorism training, because there was this big fear that like there was going to be uh, a tremendous amount of Islamic terror that was going to happen, just like it happens in Israel every day. So like, it, it goes far beyond your immediate understanding. It's like doubly ironic for uh, a, a black American man to experience this. Uh, it's tragic. Um, 
to to experience this and to see others that look like him experience this in America and then to personally experience this in an identical capacity in Israel, okay? In that moment, of course, he was not being specifically questioned as a black man. He was being questioned because the 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 IDF kid wanted to understand whether he was Muslim or not to mistreat him. I was in a territory where your mobility is inhibited, where your voting rights are inhibited, where your right to the water is inhibited, where your right to housing is inhibited, and it's all inhibited based on ethnicity. And These people drive me insane because, like, what did they think? All the Palestinian human rights groups are just lying, had to see with their own two eyes. I think that... Um, Look, Palestinians are incredibly resilient people, and and they are they are uh, incredibly forgiving. So I think that uh, you you need to welcome this kind of uh, this kind of better assessment later on. You know what I mean? Like. This interview is from yesterday, I believe. And that sounded extremely, extremely... Like, you don't understand. A, a lot of people are victim to the echo chambers that they, they exist inside of. Why should they ever question it? Careful, Hassan. Why? What did I say? Um, Like... I think there's no... Uh, I know you know Rawa Majid, very sus. What? Who the fuck is Rawa Majid? Rawa Majid is known as the Kurdish Fox, a Swedish criminal raised in Uppsala, but since a 2018 resident in Turkey, he's suspected of being the main leader of the Swedish criminal organization Foxtrot, which has linked to numerous shootings and bombings in Sweden. <laughs> what? We got some Swedish racists in the chat? What's happening? Majid's parents are from Iraqi Kurdistan, but he was born in Iran when they were fleeing Iraq on the way to Sweden during the Iran-Iraq war. Yo, dude, that's awesome. He said, Foxtrot, I know, bro. Another trash import. Wait, where are you from? I don't understand. Water in the pipe. Carter 3. Cartnark. Who is Cardi? Hassan looking like a Christmas elf. Keck W. On fucking Christmas last year. This year, he's like, I suspect you of uh, having sympathies with a, uh, with a Kurdish gang leader. Like, you, you followed me for a whole ass year, and you developed, what, like, the most advanced racism? After Rabah Majid served a long prison sentence, his cousin was murdered because of the escalating threat Majid then experienced. He was allowed by Swedish authorities to leave Sweden. Despite being under surveillance and has since resided in Turkey, he managed to purchase a Turkish citizenship in exchange for investments in 2020 through the Golden Visa Program. Despite being wanted by the Interpol, an extradition of Rabah Majid from Turkey has been requested by Sweden, but Turkey is strict on refusing to extradite citizens unless they commit crimes in Turkey, or have dual citizenships. Swedish police shared intelligence about an operation to capture Majid with Turkish police at the highest level. So what are they... They Wait, cigarette smuggling? <laughs> you reading this is confirmation? It's just, like, really funny that this guy is like, you know him. When apparently this motherfucker moved to Turkey. Like, this dude moved to Turkey nine years after I had left Turkey, like, like, <laughs> at that point, it had been nine years since I had left Turkey. I can't even remember the last time I went to Turkey. And he's like, I caught you, dude. I got him. They hid in Turkey and had a shootout there. Swedish Mafia thoughts on Turkey being a safe haven for career criminals. Many Swedish gangsters hide there. Um, I don't know. I don't know why, especially because, like, if this dude is Kurdish, it's kind of wild that he, like, <laughs> Turks don't necessarily like the Kurdish population in Sweden. As a matter of fact, the Turkish government's official position is that, uh, until recently, was literally, unless you release every Kurdish person that we have declared a fucking anti-Turkish terrorist, we will not let you into NATO. So, very odd thing. They can buy citizens. Yeah, I'm sure that this probably wasn't even, uh, uh, you know, politically a, a uh, popular thing that was allowed in Turkey because I don't think Turkish people are all too fond of, of Kurds in Sweden coming to Turkey in general. Also, 
myself, if I were to go back to Turkey, I don't know what would happen to me. Let's be fucking very real about that. So there's also that aspect of the conversation as well. Um, I have been threatened in the past. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how this, I mean, I'm a dual citizen. I have an American citizenship, so I don't know how that works there, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, keep going, dude. Uh, uh, pop off, yeah. Me and me and the me and the big homie, uh, the cigarette burglar. Tutuklarlar seni çok net ikinci bir rahip krizi yaşarız ABD ile. Vallahi yaşar mısınız bilmiyorum. ABD günü dönün ABD günün sonunda döner sizde kalsın diyebilir yani. Familiar to me. And so the most shocking thing about my time over there was how uncomplicated it actually is. Now, I'm not saying the details of it are not complicated. History is always complicated. Present events are always complicated. But the way this is reported in the Western media is as though one needs a PhD in Middle Eastern studies to understand the basic morality of holding a people in a situation in which they don't have basic rights, including the right that we treasure most, the franchise, the right to vote, and then declaring that state a democracy. It's actually not that hard to understand. It's actually quite familiar to those of us uh, with a familiarity to African, with, uh, to African American history. Well, ta Hasi Coates, last night you were asked about the significance of Martin Luther King's words on Vietnam. You said it's taken you years to, quote, understand nonviolence as an ethic and that you understood that ethic in Israel. Could you explain? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, and, I, and I think the thing to do is just to proceed off of, off of what I said. M Martin Luther King uh, dedicated his life to the fight against segregation. Israel's a segregated society. The occupied territories are segregated. The Jews are segregated. It's not, you know, hard to understand. There are different signs for where different people can go. There are different license plates forbidding different people from going different places. Now, what the authorities will tell you is that this is a, a security measure. But if you go back to the history of Jim Crow in this country, they would tell you the exact same thing. People always have good reasons besides, you know, I hate you and I don't like you to justify their right for imposing an oppressive regime on other people. It's never quite that simple. And so that was the first thing. But but the second thing I think that you're referring to is, you know, I, I you know, this don't take this the wrong way, please, because I appreciate people seeing people like him and you saying the same things basically verbatim. No, I mean, I, I like ta Ko's writing. Like, I mean, there is there's things I disagree with overall, but. I mean, I've used ta Coates in the past to describe, um, for example, uh, one of his works that I use regularly, I forget the name of it, but um, one of his works that I draw from is regularly on uh, Reconstruction, like where he very adequately breaks down uh, the dynamic of racism and how anti-black racism played a role in dividing uh, uh, the, the population not on the boundaries of class, which it seemed uh, it would, uh, which seemingly was creating new uh, allegiances between uh, wage laborer whites, like poor wage laborer whites, and also the recently uh, freed black population. And like there is an example specifically about the utilization of at least I'm not black. Like that was a, a primary, <clears throat> that was a, a, a primary function of like racial division in an effort to break down, uh, in an effort to break down any kind of like classist uprising. So, um, I think ultimately I, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, good stuff in there as well, even if uh, there's uh, some that I, I don't agree with, but doesn't matter. It's good. It's good for a, a, a cherished, celebrated, liberal journalist, writer, author, um, a person that like, you know, Barack Obama has, has hailed as like one of the most important authors. Like, it's great when he is saying the exact same things. That this I'm is saying. like really personal for me um, because I came up in a, in, a, in a time and in a place where um, I did not really understand the ethic of nonviolence. And by ethic, I mean the notion that violence itself is corrupting, that it corrupts the soul. 
And I didn't quite understand that. If, 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 if I'm truly honest with you, um, as much as I saw my relationship with the Palestinian people there, and as much as it was clear what the relationship was, it was at the same time clear that there was some sort of relationship with the Israeli people too. And it wasn't one that I particularly enjoyed. Because I understood the rage that comes when you have a history of oppression. I understood the anger. I understood the sense of humiliation that comes when people subject you to uh, uh, just manifold oppression, to genocide, and people uh, uh, look away from that. I come from the descendants of 250 years of enslavement. I come from a people who uh, sexual violence and rape is marked in our very bones and in our DNA. And I understand how when you feel that the world has turned its back on you, how you can then turn your back on the ethics of the world. But I also understood how corrupting that can be. I was listening to, uh, 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 actually, my congressman <laughs> last night, uh, or I guess it was two nights ago, talk on the news, and, and, and um, a journalist asked him, how many children, how many people must be killed to justify this operation? Is there an upper limit for the number of people that could be killed when you would say, this is just too much. This just doesn't, this just doesn't you know, uh, uh, compute. This does not add up. And I have to tell you, that congressman couldn't give a number. And I thought, that man has been corrupted. That man has lost himself. He's lost himself in humiliation. He's lost himself in vengeance. He has lost himself <clears throat> in violence. I keep hearing this term repeated over and over again. The right to self-defense. What about the right to dignity? What about the right to morality? Okay, here's one thing I want to mention, okay? Here's one thing I want to mention. I talked about this briefly with Alex, right? Remember, uh, Alex, low overruled. He's a public defender. He's uh, an abolitionist, right? Um, and one thing Alex brought up, which ta Codes brings up from a very liberal perspective, but specifically looking at the black experience in the United States of America, contemporary black experience and historical black experience, is uh, the, the uh, dynamics Right. The dynamics of what is going on in Israel in comparison to like what still happens in America in certain places. Right. And the thing I told him, I think, is very important for a lot of people to understand. Liberals do not have an issue with class violence. Right. They do not have an issue with class violence. They are conditioned to not recognize class violence as an abhorrent thing. The structural violence of poverty is completely completely and utterly removed from the the liberal lexicon or the way that liberal capitalists analyze modern society they see that as a necessary evil to a certain degree i do not however there is one form of system uh, systematic violence systemic violence that liberals also at least liberals who understand history also recognize as bad and that is Racial violence, religious violence, violence dished out on ethnic boundaries. If it's simply a system that disproportionately ruins the lives of poor people, working class individuals uh, under the auspices of, of you know, Western neoliberal capitalism, then that's kind of fine. I mean, we, we look to it. We look to the problems. We see homeless people. We say, oh, man, we got to save them somehow, right? Like, come on, this is really fucked up. Okay. But there's one form of systematic violence that even liberals find to be morally repugnant, and that is, like, object, or, or abject white supremacy, uh, Jim Crow laws, institutional forms of, of religious or ethnic discrimination. And this is precisely the reason why even most honest liberals can't look to what Israel is doing and think this is appropriate. Okay? You can't. You cannot. Because it is very obviously an apartheid. That's not true. Even liberals did colonialism. My friend, I'm not here to say liberals are also not, like, uh, uh, clued in. Or, or liberals are t completely clued in on white supremacy. I'm stating that there is a degree of white supremacist action or fascist action that liberals will uh, look in the other direction of, but there is a standard, 
right? There is a standard that if you go beyond, even honest liberals will go, that's not appropriate. You can't do that. It's the difference between institutionalized slavery in the form of the 13th Amendment, right? And, and the, the persecution that black communities face in modern American society in redlining versus Jim Crow in the South. Jim Crow rules in the South. You will not find a liberal now especially look back at Jim Crow in the South and go, that was fucking sick. However, there are still plenty of liberals now that have no framework of analyzing the racialized outcomes of class violence that is dished out towards contemporary black and brown communities. <clears throat> but an apartheid reaches that limit and goes far beyond. It's something that you can comprehend. It's something that every honest liberal who has, who has been taught lessons of dignity, autonomy, uh, 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 a, 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 a society that's supposed to peacefully coexist with equal rights and equal representation for all. When you, are, when you learn these principles and these principles you think are reflected in your society, albeit it might be incorrect, even if you are taught that these principles are the correct ones in a theoretical democracy, okay, when you see an apartheid state and you see that wanton discrimination, you see the codified discrimination, even liberals go, no, that's gross. I can't do that. That's too much. They need to stop it. And in which case, when that happens, when you reach that upper limit and you go, oh my God, that's actually fucked up. I know what that is. I've seen that before. There are conflicting forces or, or influences at play that maybe walk you back down to the justification of said apartheid state and its violence because violence is a necessity in the maintenance of an apartheid state. And those other forces are Islamophobia and the fear of Islamic terror, you know, Islamophobia and also your proximity to the problem. Okay. <clears throat> and that's precisely the reason why you turn around and you say, maybe it's complicated. Maybe it is complicated. Maybe I'm simply not understanding it. The difference between a person who is completely oblivious to that reality and a person who faces it head on and sees it and still chooses to defend that reality is very different. Okay? Okay. What about the right to, to be able to sleep at night? Because what I know is if I was complicit, and I am complicit, in dropping bombs on children, and dropping bombs on refugee camps, no matter who's there, it would give me trouble sleeping at night. And I worry for the souls of people who can do this and can sleep at night. But what is the consequence of liberals agreeing with anything? They do nothing. So there's a couple different things that are important to understand here. Liberals make up the majority of this country, okay? Everyone is a liberal. Conservatives are liberals. Uh, uh, fucking Democrats are liberals. Republicans are liberals. Everyone is a liberal. This is a liberal democracy, okay? So at the end of the day, if you want to genuinely mobilize a massive amount of the population, if you want to have a mass movement that actually... Uh, reaches the halls of Congress that applies pressure on our politicians to go against their best interest, which is to continue the endless occupation, continue America's interest in the Middle East, and to continue funding uh, Israel unconditionally, okay? You have to get liberals on board. This is why... This is why I always stress, like, the way you conduct yourself and, and the way you engage in propaganda is still important. The way you defend your positions is still important here in the United States of America. There are always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be people who want to ruin the movement, people who go in there and, and do stuff 
to to make it seem like this is an incredibly and inherently racist anti-Semitic movement, for example, this is uh, happening right now, right? But ultimately, you should move in the same way that the the, the Israeli foreign ministry moves, right? Obviously, they have a much easier time of propagandizing their position and their plight in spite of the fact that the conditions on the ground reflect a much different reality than the one that they're trying to desperately project to the American population. They can get away with doing whatever the fuck and saying whatever the fuck they want for the most part, but they still choose to propagandize. Okay? They still choose to to engage in a, a steady flow of, of information on mainstream media, okay? And, and do a whole bunch of different stuff as well, like the doxing campaigns and whatnot, okay? But there's a way that you must conduct yourself, and I think a lot of long to- uh, long-term political advocates for Palestinians know this. And it's one that maybe younger people haven't learned yet. While not every single person in a massive movement is going to be perfect, and there are going to be some people who either misspeak or some people who are legitimately anti-Semitic, for example. That, That much is true. You have to understand that the goal should still be to always... The goal should always be to have a consistent and clear and coherent message okay and that brings me to my next point of contention the campus protests that are ongoing the adl and stop anti-semitism uh moving in ways to basically um make any kind of mentions of Palestine or Palestinian people or Palestinian emancipation to be uh, considered illegal. Okay? Um, We're going to be talking about that right now. Specifically, I want to start off with this one thing that I saw yesterday from Visegrad, which is like a gross fucking outlet. I mean, they're fucking awful. Um, This is directly from the Canary Mission. They are a horrible, horrible organization that doxes anyone and everyone okay what i i'm sorry for adding you but this is important i feel this is important you should read on stream from a fellow streamer and friends his words are really well put ham and cheddar is in here all the time i'll i'll look at it uh i'll I'll read it afterwards let me just go through this real quick so this video came out This video came out, and it was like all-out war, basically. Video of Harvard students attacking a Jewish student on campus during an anti-Israel protest. One of them is Ibrahim Barmal, the editor of the Harvard Law Review. Now, everyone is calling for this guy to be fired. Now, this is from an event. This is from an event uh, two weeks ago, almost, at this point. Why did it take so long for them to come out with this video? And what are they showing in this video, really? Exit. Exit. Show him the exit. 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 Now, if you watch this chaotic video, you think, what is happening? It seems like they're swarming this guy. Exit. 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 Behind you. Turn around. Exit. 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 Okay, cool. We'll stay here. We'll stay here. We'll stay here. Exit. 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 This is a two-minute video. Anyway, let's just continue. So, so I want you to understand something. Anything you see out of the Canary Mission is going to be a fucking gross misrepresentation of events. They are not in the business of, like, honestly combating anti-Semitism. They are openly in the business of doxing anyone and everyone that says anything that is pro-Palestinian. They do this. It's Project Veritas-style bullshit, okay? They do it all the fucking time. And the fact that they are able to operate freely within U.S. boundaries is nutty to me, okay? But this, in and of itself, is a hit piece. What's that? What's that? Okay? Their job is to stop you from 
ever speaking on behalf of Palestinians. Okay? They're, that's their job. Their job is to make you feel like if you do speak for Palestinian emancipation, they will smear you as an anti-Semite. They will say you're anti-Semitic. They will do everything they can to try and get you fucking fired. They'll dox you and they'll try to get you fired. So here's the... Here is the video that came out. Okay. So, so here it is. So this is the video. It's chaotic, right? Like they're they're like forcibly pushing this guy away, right? Um, and and they did a full blown media blitz. Okay, yesterday, even though the event. Had uh, the event had taken place? This event had taken place two weeks prior. Okay. You want to be now? Canary Mission made a full blown blitz. They're asking to fire this guy, the the fucking uh, editor of the Harvard Law Review, and 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 here's what actually happened. However, this is Alejandro Caraballo. Caraballo says, "Let's see another angle." The counter protester was purposely stepping over protesters, attempting to get them on video to dox them. Okay, protest marshals used nonviolent tactics to get them to leave. Now, selectively edited videos released two weeks later to go after the fucking students. The entire reason, the entire fucking reason as to why that kid was like filming and, and harassing the fucking students down there was so that they could get their faces on camera so they could dox them. Okay, here. This is 100%. This is 100% a, a canary mission op, okay? Look. So what do they do? They use the kefia to, to block the footage. He's, like, stepping on people. And so they try to get him to peacefully leave the area. There is no better peaceful way of moving this person away from the area there's like this is perfectly this is confrontation but it's a perfectly permissible and acceptable confrontation even the video itself shows it but if you look at it from the perspective of the guy with the camera all of a sudden especially if you cut most of it all of a sudden it's like oh it's chaotic it's so chaotic they didn't beat his ass they didn't shove him they didn't do anything they didn't take their they didn't take his phone away Okay. There's a very specific goal here. The goal is to harass and document all of the pro-Palestinian activists on campus so that you can have their fucking faces blasted on vans that go all around campus. And I'll take it one step further. Vans that go to their houses. Okay. Okay. It's ridiculous that this has been distorted to make it seem like Harvard students were purposely targeting a Jewish student. They were attempting to de-escalate a situation where a student was stepping over others and holding a camera in their faces. They were using kafias to obscure the student's view and escort them away from the protesters. Okay? Now it's being spun and pushed by Canary Mission and Bill Ackman as an anti-Semitic attack to once again go after Harvard students in a vicious and disproportionate way. Let's be clear. This isn't about going after anti-Semitism. This is about intimidating students from using their right to free speech to speak in favor of Palestinians. The doxing, harassment, threats, etc. are all intended to chill students' speech and only allow one side. This in no way means that Jewish students are not terrified right now with the massive increase in anti-Semitism. Students have a right to feel safe on campus and anti-Semitism should be condemned and called out. Spinning videos to go after students who exas only exacerbates division and distrust, especially when it's external actors only seeking to sow discord for clout. We need to have a bit more patience, understanding, and empathy in this moment, or hateful rage will consume us all. Another student who was there confirms that this was the case. I was at this protest. Ibrahim was present as a safety marshal and stood in front of the mass students to protect our safety. The student was taking invasive photos and getting in our faces. In the video, you can see Ibrahim has both hands on his kefia at all times. Another student was there. I was at this protest, and I'm disheartened by the way that this has been distorted. A man was weaving across us as we were laying down peacefully, mourning the lives lost in Gaza, getting close to our faces and taking invasive pics. The safety marshals asked him to leave and escorted him. Okay? 
if you've been in this game for a long enough time, you've probably seen similar things. Like this chatter just said, also, I've seen posts claiming the chance of Israel, Israel, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide being spun as we want Jewish genocide. Okay? This was done to fucking Bella Hadid of all people a couple years prior, if you remember. This is a very old school tactic of being like, uh, if first and foremost, every single type of, of protest is not permissible in the eyes of, of uh, uh, those who want to maintain Israel's apartheid, okay? So that's number one. None of this is permissible to begin with. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we can do is say, well, the most common phrase is, uh, let's just say that immediately means you want to wipe out all Jews, okay? Not even like uh, dismantle Israel as it currently exists, an apartheid regime. It just straight up doesn't even mean that like you want to, you want to end Israel, okay? It means, like, you want to kill all Jews. That's what that means. From the river to the sea, you say that, that's anti-Semitic. So that's number one. That's lie number one. And if that doesn't work, okay, if that doesn't work, we'll say, and, and, and this is not just from, from the river to the sea, they say free Palestine is anti-Semitic as well, okay? <clears throat> and if that doesn't work, then any kind of chant at a protest will be considered... Uh, anti-Semitic, any kind of protest uh, that is in, in support of Palestinian emancipation will be considered anti-Semitic. And if there isn't something that you can find in a massive protest, okay, in a massive fucking protest, <clears throat> then you can just make it up. That's it. They just killed Mohammed Abu Hattab and his family. He was a news reporter for Palestine News Channel and was live on air half an hour before he was targeted just as he arrived at his home. Him and his family were killed. Yeah. White genius by design. Any criticism that Israeli state is anti-Semitic? I think it was Gideon Levy that said, uh, I cannot think of, uh, who is Israeli and Jewish, um, I cannot think of any other state that has been so cruel while simultaneously claiming victims so successfully. Um, I can. I think every other apartheid regime or every other state also uh, considered themselves to be the victims of this like enemy that is both powerful but also very weak and servile and docile. But um, it is especially more powerful when you link it to a very real issue, okay? It goes beyond the, the nonsensical notion that, like, white genocide is happening in America because people are engaging in miscegenation. It goes beyond that because anti-Semitism is real. <clears throat> Anti-Semitism is a real issue, right? So in my opinion, it's even more dangerous and devastating to engage in these false conflations. Okay? IDF launched a podcast. Oh, man. Today we launched the official IDF podcast. Holy fuck. Anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Okay? <laughs> IDF podcast first episode, Baby Murder Good. Yeah. So... Brooklyn white guys make another podcast shocking. Okay, dude. Um, as I was stating, though, this kind of, of uh, campus policing, okay, is, in my opinion, done with a very specific purpose. And that is to uh, further conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism which uh, the inverse of that also happens where uh, the Israeli state itself and defenders of the Israeli state themselves will claim Israel is, uh, uh, Israel is the only place for Jews on the planet and that all Jews on the planet care about Israel and want to defend Israel unconditionally. Okay? El Hassan, El Take Hassanabi, El Take. I would love to hear your perspective. Do not, blo do not ban that guy. I would love... Love to hear. The guy chasing him said Kyle did not shoot until he pulled the gun on him and aimed him. Oh, of course, a Kyle Rittenhouse defender. Uh, <clears throat> a Kyle Rittenhouse defender uh, also defends the Kyle Rittenhouse of nations. <laughs> Israel. <laughs> Classic. Thank you. 
but he's a game watcher, so we'll keep him. We're not going to ban him. So, <clears throat> yes, we're going to talk about the tearing down of the posters. Okay? In a second. In a second. Um, What the fuck was I going to say? Hold on. God damn it. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention here, but I cannot remember what I was going to say. We were talking about college campuses. We were talking about, oh, campus activism. Oh, here, here, here. This is what I was going to say. So, anti-Semitism is real. It's a real issue. Anti-Semitism flares up uh, during times of, of uh, Israeli sieges in the Western world. That much is a certainty. It is real. It happens. Okay. I will never tell you that anti-Semitism is not a real issue. Okay. That would be ridiculous. It would be a falsehood. Now, having said that, there are a lot of anti-Semites out there. But it seems, and this is my, my opinion on the matter, maybe it's not true. I'm, I'm willing to uh, have people tell me I'm wrong on this. I'm open to criticisms. It seems to me like, given the fact, given the demography, the demographics of, of Zionism in the United States of America and in the Western world as a whole, okay, it seems to me like, and I replied to this person, Armand Domolowski or whatever, and this is what my thoughts are, it seems to me like, given that the overwhelming majority of ultra-Zionists in this country and specifically in the Western world are Christian because there aren't that many Jews to begin with, right? Both anti-Zionist or Zionist Jews, right? Given the demographics, it seems to me like a lot of Christian Zionists are not fearful of the neo-Nazi opportunists that are gaining clout and momentum off of the, the anti-Israel sentiment that is growing in the Western world. They do not focus on the anti-Semitic neo-Nazis nearly as much as they focus on the Palestinian activists. Now, you have to ask, why is that the case? Because statistically speaking, anti-Semitic launderers of, of anti-Zionist sentiment, who are anti-Semitic themselves, who use anti-Zionism in an effort to push anti-Semitism, okay? Who are neo-Nazis themselves do not get the same kind of New York Post coverage. They do not get the same kind of wall-to-wall -wall criticism. There are literal neo-Nazis on this fucking platform. Something that I and many others have criticized Elon Musk on time and time again. So one must ask themselves, what's going on here? Why? Why? Why is it that uh, this kind of sentiment goes on and I don't really see a lot of anger specifically directed towards very clear white supremacist opportunists. As a matter of fact, the only thing I do see is a conflation between white supremacist neo-Nazis engaging in clear-cut anti-Semitism with predominantly students of color engaging in pro-Palestinian action. It almost sometimes feels like People only point to these guys to say, look, these guys represent the other guys as well. And it's never these guys that anybody goes after. It's always the students that everybody goes after. Jewish students, Palestinian students, black and brown students, white students, as long as they are pro-Palestine. And some people are more honest about it. My, in my replies, there are people who openly say, you mean to tell me that the bigger threat for Israel right now is some fucking dumbass Nazi when Nazi Germany is done and not Palestinians? And it's like, oh, well, there you go. You already admitted it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Statistically speaking, however, the, the gravest threat for 
uh, Jewish Americans, okay, or Jews living in the Western world is not Arabs, is not Muslims. It's white supremacist neo-Nazis, okay? The dude who did the synagogue shooting in, in Pittsburgh was not a Muslim fundamentalist. He was not doing it at the behest of uh, a, the Palestinian liberation, okay? That was a white supremacist Nazi, a Trump supporter, as a matter of fact, a white supremacist Nazi that shot up and engaged in the worst anti-Semitic hate crime in contemporary American history. Why did he do this? Well, he openly stated why he did it. He said he did it because Jews were opening up the floodgates of immigration into America in an effort to engage in white genocide. An argument that is as old as time itself, pretty much. The great replacement narrative that is channeled through Tucker Carlson, through so many Fox News broadcasters. Who contributes more to anti-Semitism? Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity that say George Soros, a Jew, is responsible for the darkening of America by opening up the floodgates with his Open Societies Foundations that creates immigrant caravans? Is it that kind of messaging being broadcasted from some of the most popular news broadcasts on the fucking planet, especially in the United States of America? Or is it students organizing after seeing thousands of dead Palestinian children and saying, enough is enough. You have to put a stop to this. The Israeli apartheid regime must come to an end. We have a moral obligation to stop it. Where is the anti-Semitism actually coming from? I am starting to realize that the conflict does not have to do with religion at all, as you have stated. If it has something to do with religion, it's not the Jewish religion, and it's certainly not the Muslim religion. It's not Islam. It's not Judaism. It has more to do with Christian theology, and not even regular old Christian theology. I'm not even talking about fucking Catholicism here. I'm talking a very specific offset. Evangelical Protestants who believe in the Armageddon, who believe that the rapture will happen. And that is precisely why Israel must settle on all of that land, that all of that land belongs to the Jews, so that Jesus Christ can come back to earth and fight the devil And then all of the good, God-fearing, evangelical Christians can be sucked into the heavens. So to this guy, I replied, that person is a neo-Nazi opportunist. I have criticized this person and, and criticized Twitter for letting this person fucking run wild already. I said, that person is a neo-Nazi opportunist. The new owner of the platform openly unbanned all of them. Christian Zionists far outnumber Jewish Zionists and anti-Zionists. And they aren't worried about neo-Nazis as much as they are about POC protesting against Israel on campus. Okay. This is the truth. This is 100% the truth. And there are unfortunately a lot of people, a lot of people that are refusing to reckon with that reality. Some are opportunists on the Zionist side. Right? Because, listen... If you don't go after these fucking Nazis who do legitimately pose a threat and their followers who do legitimately pose a threat to American Jews, right? Then you can always say, look, they're, they're aligned. They're aligned with the fucking Palestinian protesters. You see that? You see that? They're aligned. They're coming after us. Okay? I don't think the broad majority of Zionists, both Christian and, and Jewish legitimately are making this mental calculation, okay? I don't think that every single one of them is, right? But there are definitely organizations, in my opinion, that shift their focus on any kind of criticism of Israel being declared anti-Semitic that don't do any of this that don't use any of their resources against those who are openly anti-Semitic. And because anti-Semitism is a very real problem, there is a 
massive amount of people that you could be targeting, <clears throat> that you could be criticizing, that you could be talking about, okay? But instead, you spend all of your time yelling at fucking college students. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and it's unserious. It's unserious, especially because, as I said, the real dangerous anti-Semitism, the actual anti-Semitism comes from neo-Nazis and white supremacists alike. <clears throat> Bro, I know it's hard, but if you didn't cuss, we would not have to listen on headphones at work. You could potentially inadvertently reach 60,000 people every day, homie, and do more good for the world, I'm just saying. <clears throat> <clears throat> I will try to not curse as much. Meanwhile, you have this going on. The Iowa Democratic Party was recently made aware of a statement made by the University of Democrats of Iowa, which included problematic anti-Semitic slogans, including, from the river to the sea, the, Pal the Palestine will be free. Let's be very clear. This is a call for Jewish genocide, and we wholly condemn this offensive language. <clears throat> Iowa Democratic Party stands with the innocent civilians, Israeli and Palestinian, that have had their lives ruined by the terrorist group Hamas. Yeah. This is a double bind. You know what I mean? It's like the Israeli bombs that are fucking lasering Palestinian children, also uh, a consequence of Hamas. Palestinian children at the precipice of complete starvation. Who put that there? Who made those conditions? Not Israel, of course. That must be Hamas. It must be Hamas. It's always Hamas. <clears throat> it's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. And I do believe that uh, given that there is a lot more information that's readily available and accessible outside that is more, um, that is infinitely more digestible on other platforms at a time when uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on mainstream media, I think that uh, younger generations who have only seen Israel to be an incredibly brutal occupation are genuinely coming to terms with its war crimes and saying, ah, I don't really think this is appropriate. I don't think this is appropriate at all. <clears throat> but there is a sea change. The tide is turning. And I say this as someone who has been advocating for Palestinians for 10 fucking years publicly. Okay? Okay. There is certainly every, every year there are more atrocities that Israel commits that people see for exactly what it is, okay? And I think that is what the Israeli foreign ministry fears the most. Israel is a victim of its own success in its ethnic cleansing campaign, okay? That's what it is. <clears throat> they are too good at engaging in ethnic cleansing. Too good. Far too good. They're far too ferocious. They're far too brutal. So no matter how much the media immediately tries to contextualize that violent act of bombing a refugee camp into oblivion three days in a fucking row, no matter how hard you put the IDF guy on there, to just contextualize that violence and to say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is appropriate. We have to kill all these Palestinians. We have to. We must. At the end of the day, people still recognize that this is wrong. There is a moral rot. Okay? <laughs> I love this. Weenie Linguini. Hey, Hassan, have you talked about Pakistan expelling 1.7 million Afghanis, and are you going to call that a genocide? Or do you have a strict policy not to cover Muslim versus Muslim atrocities? Yeah. Uh, one of the few places where I've talked, where, where you can actually get information on the Saudi blockade on Yemen and an ongoing genocide has a very strict policy of not covering Muslim on Muslim uh, atrocities. I love that. I love that white supremacists are always the same. You just hit me with a black on black violence argument, man. The fuck is wrong with you? You just hit me with a fucking black on black violence argument. Like, it's crazy. You think I'm, you think this is the first time I've encountered some fucking stupid shit like this? And yes, of course, expelling, forcibly expelling 1.7 million refugees because of your, your, 
uh, uh, <laughs> horrible foreign policy that ends up harming 1.7 million Afghan refugees is unimaginable cruelty. It's completely unacceptable. Why the fuck would I say anything other than that? But it is so gross that you bring this up specifically, specifically in the midst of like my coverage of our tax dollars directly going to the, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Like you just betrayed your own supposed moral high ground. The only time you care about it is when you can use it as a talking point. It's fucking disgusting. <clears throat> That's crazy, dog. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> like, here, I'll tell you. If you want to troll in here a little bit better, if you want a virtue signal or do like the just curious argument, cut the second part out, stupid. Because the second part, you can't just openly say. When you say the second part openly, you immediately give the game away. Like, you're like, you came in here and you were like, I am the biggest racist piece of shit. Hello. Welcome. Stop teaching them how to be better racists. I mean, it would be more, it would be better for him to fucking not put the second part because it gives the game away. You're immediately showing everyone that knows a little bit about how this, uh, how this works. That you're in it specifically for, like, winning a fucking argument with your 2012 created account. This is blowback for Pakistan. The Pakistani ISI uh, destabilized Afghanistan in the 80s with the U.S. and also allowed America to use Pakistan as a base in the Afghanistan war. Now that the country next to them is a wholly failed state, they cry they have too many refugees from a Pakistani fuck Pakistan middle finger emoji. Not all 2012 accounts. Yeah, not all. Um, okay. Here. This is one other aspect of this conversation. Before I get to uh, before I get to this, okay, the today's cover from the New York Post, which, as you guys know, is definitely not a right wing dish rag that doles out uh, tremendous amounts of content that uh, absolutely is is uh, the same kind of narratives that I've talked about with respect to Fox News, like uh, the whole. Jews are responsible, or one Jew, singular Jew, George Soros, is responsible for, uh, you know, uh, uh, browning out America by allowing refugee caravans to come in. Yeah, that these guys, they they love they they love combating uh, anti-Semitism. Okay, they call Palestinians animals on the front page just last week. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry for having an older account. Fuck me. No, I will not be fucking you. But also, chill the fuck out, okay? Calm down. Like, not everything is about you, okay? So, um, this video went viral on Twitter. And it is the, it is the next wave of, like, don't think about 3,000 uh, murdered children with our tax dollars and our missiles. And instead, talk about how... How, how horrifying what these guys are doing is. And they, they're horrifying because they hate Jewish people, okay, specifically. I'll show you the, I'll, I'll show you the video in a second. Um, but, of course, what I do want to show you is the top of the hour ad break, uh, which comes at the top of every hour. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe, which you could do for $5 or free with Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Of course, I don't want to show you the top of the hour ad break. I want to show you... Uh, you know, the, the commentary. So just subscribe uh, or you can get gifted a sub. If you're lucky, here's a three minute ad break now. All right. Um, is this the video? Hamas support and anti-Semitism have been the highest used reasons as to why it's okay. Civilians need to die. Yeah. <clears throat> Isn't ripping the post is kind of cringe. It is. Not only is it cringe, but it's also unhelpful. And you are literally, you are literally giving in to why those posters are put up to begin with. It's not like, like those posters are put up specifically because they want to invoke a feeling, okay? A feeling that you should have, which is that it is fucked up that these are children that, uh, uh, have, been, uh, that have been held hostage. Those children are also being bombed as well, okay? So make no mistake, the posters are propaganda. Of course they are. But just like I do propaganda, right? And I said this, as soon as I saw the posters, I said, it's a trap. It's a fucking trap. Don't touch the fucking posters. You're dumb. You're dumb. Don't touch the posters. Okay? 
especially because the major reason as to why, if the you touch those posters, is because Ben Shapiro is going to make a video out of it. And he's going to say, look, you're showing that you don't give a fuck about Israeli children. You don't care about Israeli children. You don't care about Israeli hostages. You know who doesn't care about Israeli hostages? Benjamin motherfucking Netanyahu. So do not, under any circumstance, allow this fucking demon and others to... to Make an example out of you to like cut this fucking propaganda to a, a bunch of liberal liberal squishes because the broad consensus in the United States of America for those who like actually you can have on your side is that they're squishes. So aesthetics are a little important, okay? When you want to uh, build a a broad coalition, this is of course entirely removed from like how Palestinians move, how Palestinians operate or what Hamas has done. I'm not even talking about that, right? I'm talking about specifically, talking about specifically carrying yourself a certain way. So the worst thing you could do in that situation is rip up the posters, okay? Because you'll be caught on camera. Best thing you can do in that situation is put the many different names of the Palestinian children that have been slaughtered. Put posters of them up everywhere. Have Zionists come and fucking try to rip those off. Do the same thing, but in reverse. And if they come and rip those off, film them. Expose them for their cruelty. That's it. There is a reason why, there is a reason why this is so effective. It, the 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 reality is like I understand being angry. I understand how unjust the situation is for Palestinians. Okay, it it is, and we're going to be covering this Daily Dot article as well. It's very good. Talia Jane uh, wrote about this. Okay, and make no mistake, I'm not going to sit here and be like this is the worst kind of anti-Semitism I've ever seen. No, get the fuck out of here. Okay. Get the fuck out of here. These are angry people. They're doing something wrong that I consider to be wrong. I consider it to be both wrong and also additionally bad because it's going to be used against you. No matter what happens, there is a way that you have to carry yourself. I've talked often about the callous indifference to human life that... Those who are in support of Israel's apartheid state can present when talking about a Palestinian or an Arab or a Muslim. But you, if you are defending Palestine, cannot do that. And there is no honor in breaking through that boundary because the unfortunate reality is if you are presenting yourself and your movement to America as a whole, when there's a sea of Islamophobia and they're going to say you're anti-Semitic anyway, you cannot give up any ground you can't do that most people who have been at this for a very long time are aware of this reality okay sometimes you do have to Sometimes you do have to capitulate to not uh, someone who is advocating against you, but you do have to capitulate to the whims of the broader audience that you want to represent your moral case to, okay? To a certain degree. So where's the video? Does anyone have that? I don't think it matters. If, the, if it wasn't this, there would be something else. Islamophobic peeps won't change. Media will find whatever opportunity to show Arabs in a bad light. Yeah, 100%. 100,000%. Okay? But there's varying degrees of, like, acceptability. Think about how easy it is for me to dismiss when I am uh, trying to help liberals come to terms with uh, Israel's apartheid regime. Think about how easy it is when someone says, oh, from the river to the sea is actually deeply anti-Semitic. They want to kill all Palestinians. I mean, they want to kill all Israelis, right? Uh, they want to kill all Jews. You can very easily go, no, that's wrong. But the reality is, everything, every single thing that you do, you have to be thinking, is this productive? Am I, am I genuinely 
Okay? Am I genuinely helping the cause? Okay? Because this is propaganda. Of course it's propaganda. But when you do that, you've played into the propaganda. Okay? You've played into the propaganda because you have highlighted, you have heightened the propaganda. You've legitimized it. Just give him less ammo. It's that simple. Someone, someone says they're not here. Like, what, what are you going to do? Find them here, I think, in one of the videos. Fuck you. And I mean, don't listen. rip down these posters. Like, again, again, you need to understand. Stop saying base. Stop saying base in the fucking chat. Oh, God, you guys are so stupid. You're doing it. You're doing the thing. You're doing the exact same thing. There is probably at least 1,000 people in here right now that is screen recording every single fucking person that said base just now to be like, look, Hassan loves it. Hassan hates Israeli babies. Notice how Hassan fucking uh, didn't immediately and regularly condemn it. It's like, bro. It is so fucking disingenuous to act like you give a single shred of a fuck about Israeli children being held hostage by Hamas right now when the Israeli government that you're defending is blowing up those fucking hostages, okay? It's ridiculous. You know who's fucking taking down those posters in Tel Aviv? Motherfucking Benjamin Netanyahu supporters. You want to know why? Because they see it as counterproductive. They see it as propaganda that is actually harming the war efforts, okay? So stop. I know that here in the United States of America, this is specifically, specifically created, okay, to invoke this kind of, invoke this kind of reaction so they can continue it. It's that simple. Why do you give into this idea that there's any utility of hanging these posts in America outside of justifying genocide of funding Israel? What do you mean? I, I am saying that. There's no real utility here, there, but it's a trap, and you're willingly walking into the trap. Like, that's my point. That is what I'm saying. The point of those posters in and of itself is not to be like, look at all these uh, children that are lost, okay? The point of these posters, the real point of these posters is so that someone goes and fucking tries to rip it off so they can fucking film it and go, look, look at these scary Arabs. They hate it. They have... No interest in, in, in Israeli lives, okay? And it does look like that. It looks like that to every single person that's watching it that isn't as invested in, in the, the plight of Palestinians. You have to carry yourself a certain way. Here, let's talk about it, okay? Now, obviously, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to bend over backwards to condemn them. I don't, uh, I, I, I do think that it's unhelpful and unproductive and you shouldn't do it, okay? Especially when you should know that you have to be very careful with the way that you present your argument. Unfortunately, okay, in America, if you want to apply any kind of fucking stress towards any kind of pressure towards the, the government, you have to have a broad coalition. And in order to have a broad coalition, you have to bring liberals onto your side as well. And liberals can be brought to your side. However, the issue is, the issue is in this situation if you deal with it in this way, then the only thing that Americans will talk about is this, is not saying that you have to like, it, you know, roundly condemn these people, okay? But this is what, this is what will happen. Look at this, this has got 20,000 likes. Now, the fucking hilarious uh, circumstance here is that there are a ton of Zionist counter-protesters, both Christian and Jewish, but predominantly Christian as a matter of fact, like, engaging in acts of violence against any number of different uh, Palestinians. People that aren't even like at a Palestinian protest, but just straight up looking Muslim. And th it's not going to ever get this kind of coverage. It's absolutely stupid because we should care equally about the hostages as we do about Palestinian humans. Life is human life. I agree. Exactly. As an Arab, I've had to be hyper vigilant my entire life when protesting because all they want to do is catch you on something to demonize us further. Yes, exactly. I think a lot of people just, like, don't want to think about that or don't recognize that, like, why this kind of thing happens to begin with. Like a trap. Are posters of Israeli hostages drawing awareness or baiting pro-Palestinians into getting canceled when they tear them down? I think people are looking at the fact that they are so one-sided about these missing people. 
You are promoting Zionism, says a young woman carrying a wad of papers while being tailed by someone filming a fairly empty promenade. Promenade. I am promoting Zionism. I am a Zionist, retorts the person filming. So you basically think genocide against Palestinians is justified, the woman replies. Great question. The video is one of uh, is one of more than a dozen similar videos circulating online. Each depicts a person or people removing a poster of Israeli hostages while others confront them. In one, a woman in a bright pink coat removes a post from a streetlight and yells, you support genocide, you asshole, at the person filming. In another, a person removing a post from an electrical box appears to refer to the person filming them as a dog. A man gets a camera shoved in his face in yet another clip that shows a small group accosting him for removing posters. He asks the crowd, but what about the Palestinians? Most people depicted removing the poster have been identified, launching calls for them to lose their jobs, get kicked out of school, and a barrage of internet trolls. Okay? The posters themselves were created and originally distributed innocuously enough. This part is also true. The original posters, especially in Israel, play an entirely different role in Israel than it does in the United States of America. The posters were originally created... Yeah, uh, they were arrested for vandalism. You can't commit a crime in the name of free speech and expect to get away with it. Well, I mean, you can make the argument of like uh, putting up posters being also an act... Uh, that is uh, could be criminally punished, but no one's going to do that, obviously. But and and they shouldn't. So this isn't about like optics and respectability politics. Exactly, this is about laying a trap and and having people fucking step directly into it. Okay. If you are an activist, if you care about a cause, you always have to think: Am I doing something that is productive? I know a lot of people in my hater communities make fun of me for using that term a lot, but it is important, okay? If you want to engage in, in, in uh, building a movement, if you want to engage in coalition building, you have to think about these things from a broader context. And one of those contexts, especially if you're in the fucking Western world, is like how it will be viewed, okay? If this was not important, if the, if the aesthetics and the optics weren't important, then there would be no need for Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, they are a perfect representation of a group that is very clear, very coherent on their agenda, okay? They're all Jewish. They all wear the same T-shirts that very clearly define it. Why is there a need for that? Why is there a need for that? Because people are ruthlessly trying to uh, uh, analyze under a microscope every single thing that you do if you are saying pro-Palestine in an effort to vilify you, okay? Okay? And it never to vilify you. So you cannot leave any room for, for confusion. Now, does this mean, does this mean that there will not be people that uh, cut through that and still engage in actions that can either be misconstrued or even people that say like uh, horrifyingly anti-Semitic things even in protests and whatnot? Okay. That will happen. It will always happen. There's no way to avoid that in a mass movement. But the goal should always be to minimize it. That's why I showed you an example of that, uh, an example of, of, of uh, protest marshals very quickly and very efficiently dealing with students that were coming in to counter protest and antagonize and even dox, right? Even when you do it right, you will still get vilified. But when you do it right and you get vilified, you can at least defend this position. Okay? I'm so torn on this, reading so many black radicalist writings about all this and then speak about how you can't appease people who you think are animals being black. I feel that every day, or maybe I'm just pissed off. Listen, guys, there's two different... There's always going to be two different forms of, of uh, both protesting and doing activism. Okay? What would your reaction be to people instead putting up those murder by Israel posters, kids directly on top? Would it be falling into the same trap? Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. Guess what? I'm saying you should do that. Of course. And people would fucking take those down and not a single peep would happen. As a matter of fact, they have done that. And there's no fucking New York Post article on it. You want to know why? Because this is an Islamophobic country. It's the exact same reason. It is the exact same fucking reason as to why uh, they, they don't fucking go on the ground and ask the Gazans 
how they feel about the bombing campaign and immediately have an IDF spokesperson contextualize why this incredible asymmetric violence is being doled out to the Palestinian population as a whole. Why this ethnic cleansing campaign is actually truly morally righteous and justifiable. Because there is a dual, there's a double standard. There's a double standard. Everyone knows this. Please, you know this. You're Palestinian, you know this. That's how it works. There is a double standard. Here, there is no better representation of said double standard than this. Remember that the citizens of Gaza, these innocent civilians who so many people are shedding tears about, they voted for Hamas in the last election. And they would probably vote for Hamas today. So yeah, they're non-combatants, they're civilians, but they're supporters of Hamas. Whereas the people who were killed in, in Israel, many of them were not supporters of Netanyahu. That's insane. That's an insane thing to say. Many of them represented kind of left-wing kibbutzniks, peace activists, people who were opposed to the Netanyahu government, people who wanted a two-state solution, people who were opposed to the settlements, people who were opposed to the occupation, and they were killed. And so when you look at these civilian deaths, you have to ask yourself a question. How many of them really are a civilian? Yeah, ask that question. Now... To which I replied, if you were to say the overwhelming majority of Israel supports uh, the current ethnic cleansing campaign in Gaza, which is true, 83% of Israeli Jews, not my designation, the designation of Israel is Jew versus Arab, even though it is inherently a, a uh, racist uh, designation in my opinion, but Israel is an apartheid state, so they make that. But 83% of Jews in Israel as opposed to the 70% of Palestinian citizens of Israel, the Arabs in Israel, um, according to the uh, Israeli Democracy Institute, do not care, or, or sorry, um, 83% of uh, Israeli Jews believe that it is unimportant the, the, the casualties, the civilian casualties, the Palestinians that die are not important in Israel's latest siege, okay? 83%. So does this mean that they all deserve, like the entirety of Israel deserves an equivalent violent retaliation that targets Israeli schools, hospitals, bakeries? No, of course not. That would be immoral. And that would be designated as terrorism. Everyone would say, you're a fucking psycho. You're a terrorist. You love terrorism. However, Alan Dershowitz, Jeffrey Epstein's, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's favorite uh, friend and defender, Alan, I never took my underwear off Dershowitz, can get away with saying this. Congresspersons can get away with saying this. Why? Because they're saying it as they're defending Israel. And the enemies of Israel are Arabs, they're Palestinians, they're Muslims, they're scary, they're bad. We've already dehumanized them over the course of the past fucking 20, 30 years. To which this guy replied, and I had to reply back to him, Hamas targeted civilians. Why aren't you blaming Hamas for this? Israel is held to a higher standard by you than Hamas. Why is that? And he didn't even understand my argument. I said, why is one of the strongest militaries in the world with a secret nuke that gets $4 billion every year from the U.S. to run an apartheid state not held to the same standards as a fundamentalist militant movement that was born as a reaction to existing under those gruesome conditions? Okay? But of course, because if you're biased, you don't understand my point here. If you're biased, you think... I'm saying Israel should be held to a higher standard. And I think Israel should be held to a higher standard, of course. It's a fucking militarized state, right? It has all of the power to end the violence. But in that circumstance, I'm not even saying Israel should be held to a higher standard. I'm saying, why can't you hold Israel to the same standard as Hamas? But because... Because people are already inherently biased, okay? Because people are already inherently biased, they immediately go, oh, pff, what? What? You just, uh, I don't understand. Uh, Israel should have even lower standards, actually. You didn't go against the guy who attacked uh, uh, Finkelstein accepting a good faith argument? I'm just saying. I, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 
You're a better tweeter than you are a streamer, and you're an amazing streamer. I mean, I think it's a little bit different when I don't have to, like, go off the cuff. You clearly don't want apartheid means if you think Israel is the one that is apartheid. Sit this one out, boss. Wait, what? You clearly don't want apartheid means? The fuck? The fucking IDF bots are out, dude. My replies are a shithole. Major Hassan L. That is unequivocally invalid. Hamas, a fundamentalist religious organization. They were born to rid Palestine of the Jews. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, Israel, on the other hand, is not actively engaging in an ethnic cleansing campaign uh, that is being backed by, like, openly backed by, and openly celebrated by this fucking guy right now who's defending Israel and many others who are in the Knesset. Ministers. That's it. Huh. <sighs> You are biased. Children voted for Hamas, don't you know? 3,000 voting children slaughtered. Nice. What a fucking idiot. Exactly. I'm biased. Anyway, <laughs> I actually think Israel, the most democratic and virtuous country in the region, should be held to lower standards as they are the good guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that's how I think. I'm a baby. I'm a child. I also think... Uh, that good people do good things, Israel, and bad people do bad things, uh, uh, Palestinians, Palestinian children especially. They are responsible for a lot of the bad things, which is why good should triumph over evil. Okay, got it. Can you finish your thought about the two different forms of resistance? Yes, there is always going to be more militant forms of resistance in comparison to a broader coalition-building effort, the, the dynamic between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, okay? These two forces work side by side with one another, no matter how people try to tell you that one triumphs over the other. They are both a necessity. I am a communicator, okay? I am a commentator. There, you're not going to fucking get me to be like, no, it's fucking sick. Thank God people are ripping these fucking posters. I think that's, because I think it's bad. It's bad. It's, it's not a good thing to do. Fuck you in that propaganda. You know, I, I don't. Specifically because it, you're, you're then being used, okay? You will be used no matter what. If you are defending, if you are defending Palestinians, you will be used no matter what. They will say that you're anti-Semitic. If they can't find anything, here, I'll give you... I'll give you some. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example for myself. I have roundly condemned Hamas pretty much every single time I've opened my fucking mouth for the first, for the first like, two weeks of the bombing campaign as Israel was, like, ruthlessly slaughtering Palestinian children. I kept doing it over and over again. Over and over and over again. And, and I do. I do think that that violence is unjustifiable. It is not permissible. I'm against the, the uh, ruthless slaughter of civilians. Okay? It doesn't matter if they're... Uh, Israeli, it doesn't matter if they're Palestinian. Now, having said that, what ended up happening? Every single person still said, I'm Hamasabi. And every single person still said, I'm a terrorist. Every single person still said, I love uh, Jews being slaughtered globally. Okay, it didn't stop people from lying. First, they went and tried to fucking find people in my audience, right? First, they tried to find people in my fucking audience, in my community, to be like, look, we found some clips of Hassan, uh, well, we couldn't find clips of Hassan, but we found clips from his audience of, like, you know, 50,000 people watching, like, that, they, that his mods couldn't get to fast enough. These guys are, they love it. They're fans. Then they did the same shit. They went into my Reddit and were like, look, his, his community is, like, uh, uh, anti-Semitic. His community is bad. They love Hamas. They celebrate it. They are big fans because they couldn't do anything to me. Then they turned around and said, look, Hassan still says, like, when I'm having a conversation with Ethan about uh, the, the uh, settlers in the West Bank, something that Ethan and I agree on, that is, like, something that the international community agrees on, okay, is that it's completely unjustifiable, and it is, a, it is an act of terror, okay? And they turn around and they said, oh, he's, he's saying, like, uh, you know, babies should be ruthlessly slaughtered. So... No matter what happens, no matter what happens, they will always smear you. So don't give, them, don't give them an opportunity to do so. Always maintain a defensible position. Okay? 
just recognize that there's always going to be a double standard. You're always fighting. You are always fighting from a position where the broader majority, you're pretty hated on the internet lately. It's not lately. It's always, okay? It's always. And it, it will be forever because nobody fucking, nobody represents leftist politics and, and social progress across the board unconditionally on every fucking boundary, especially even on America's foreign policy endeavors in a clear manner without drawing a lot of fucking ire. These are not popular subjects. If it was popular, I'd be sitting over here, you know, playing video games and watching fucking YouTube videos instead of trying to endlessly describe this position to people who refuse to understand it. Damn, this guy's good.